I do host a television show with Access called Eternity, and I lead people to the Lord there. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. It's a real pleasure to be able to share my testimony of my near-death experiences as has been coined by Dr. Raymond Moody. My name is Susan Harris, as you may have known from seeing the poster or hearing from your friend. And I was born and raised on the island of Trinidad. We were a family of nine children, and my parents had two goals for us, that we would love God and that we would be educated. And those goals came true for us. I was a teacher for a number of years, and I immigrated to Canada, and I have been preaching the gospel for over three decades now. In 50 years, I have had three near-death experiences, three supernatural miraculous healings without the intervention of medicine. I have had four visions and six encounters with angels, if I count the one that happened in the month of June. Now, if you add up all of those years, you'd probably get 101, and that would be my age. So because I am um, talking about near-death experiences, I borrowed a little something from the internet. There was this woman who died and went to heaven, and she stood before God, and God said, I have to send you back because it's not your time yet. So she was sent back, and she thought, I have a number of years to live, so I am going to just do a few little things. So she colored the hair and whitened the teeth and did some Botox and did some uh, liposuction and a whole bunch of things and really prettied up herself differently. And as she was leaving the hospital, she got knocked over by an ambulance and she found herself again before God. And she said, but God, you told me I had 43 more years to live. Why am I here? And God said to her, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> so that was a little one that I borrowed because I will be speaking on and reading on near-death experiences. I'm going to read leading up to my first visit to heaven. And in that visit, I experienced two miraculous healings and I have medical records to prove these. In 1998, I flew back to Trinidad to finish my teaching contract. At the end of the term, I resigned the job and returned to Canada. One day in August, I was lying in bed in my cool, dim bedroom when I saw it, a quick flash, and then it was gone. Since we couldn't paint the walls of the rented condominium, I had picked blue and white bedding to create a cherry nest. The warm brown of the oak closets contrasted against the pristine walls, and tiles winked in assorted hues of aqua through the door of the master bedroom. A crystal chandelier hung from the ceiling, its faceted points sparkling indigo, red and silver when the switch was activated. But this morning there were no prismatic effects. No light, no music, nothing. I lay on my bed groaning and restless, trying to find a position to relieve the nausea. I wanted to feel normal, but I didn't know why I was unwell. That's when I saw a ray of sunshine on the white wall and the word radiance dancing in uppercase letters. I rubbed my eyes. Was it my imagination? Was it the sun? Our apartment faced west, and the early morning sun had not yet risen. As quickly as it appeared, the beam disappeared. A few weeks later, my pregnancy was confirmed, the day after we buried my brother Ronald in Trinidad. I had been active in the preparations even unstacking and stacking iron chairs we had rented for the wake. So my brother Ronald had been killed in a car accident on the highway. We had gone down for the funeral. The Lord takes one and he gives one. The people around had commented. Everyone was joyful. 
My husband made known his wish for a boy right away and turned to the Bible for names. But I didn't think he really looked very far in the Bible because in an instant, he had chosen the name. He chose the name Samuel. And Samuel epitomized the unimpeachable character, the prophet and the teacher who established the schools for the prophets in the Old Testament. And the name Samuel for a boy would have been fine had not my aunt taken me to her in-laws, had not I, a young man from next door come over, had not I been his sister's teacher, and had he not wanted to date me, and had he not been named Samuel. So Samuel could not be a name for my son because of all those reasons. I wanted to name the baby Klein, but someone who said, there's a premier out west named Ralph Klein, and nobody likes him very much. Don't name your baby Klein. Well, I didn't care. I know you would never find everybody liking one person. Anyway, October um, holds a special significance for me. It's my birth month, and there's anticipation of surprises, presents, parties, and trips. October 1998, however, would be memorable for another reason, and not a fun one. Weight loss, nausea, and vomiting marked the days as they had marked the entire first trimester of my pregnancy. Later, I would learn the name of this debilitating morning sickness as hyperemesis gravidarum, or HG, now made prominent by Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge. But I was sick day and night, and not just on mornings. Smell was my worst enemy. I could have joined a canine unit and sniffing out scents, wait not for the nausea that washed over me from food, cologne, toothpaste, and everyday household products. Taste conspired with smell to whirl my head in dizzy circles. So the morsels of toast and milk I attempted were rejected before I could swallow them. The calcium needed for my baby's bones lay in a putrid mess in the little pail next to the bed. I could not drink water because its taste was so pungent that it would just rise up again and come out. Uh, I could not read because words swam before my eyes. I could not watch television because at any moment an advertisement showing an egg sandwich or any kind of food would pop up and it would induce the vomiting again. I thought my hearing was okay. A member of the church used to cook for my husband, and at a certain hour, the phone would ring. And now I started to make associations when the phone started to ring for him to go and get his lunch. I started to become sick. I grew worse and worse. every day, my life slowly going, coming out. I couldn't eat anything except popsicles, and those things came out within 15 minutes also. So this is the lead up to where I will be going with my reading for the doctor. I was like Pavlov dogs. As Pavlov dogs would salivate at the ring of a bell, I began to nauseate at the sound of the telephone ring. Friends from church took up vigil for me. They sacrificed their comfortable homes for a sick home like mine. But when they would rustle their soil and their sandwiches, I would begin to think they were going to eat. Or if they were taking down a plate or a saucer to warm up something in the microwave, that would set off the nausea. And then when the people from the other apartments in the condominium building would cook, we had no control over that. And I felt every day that this was going to be the last that I was certainly going to die. I said to my husband, I can't have anyone in the house. I have to be alone. I implored. I could tell them I am well. Tell them I am not sick anymore. It was an expression of faith. I'll phone you if I need anything. You can come home for lunch. 
I was desperate and my pleading increased. Reluctantly, he agreed to my urging. The ladies no longer came and I remained in my bed, a recluse, a prisoner. My own blood family was over 4,000 kilometers south in the Caribbean. The Atlantic Ocean beating upon the Canada and Trinidad symbolized the waves of sickness copiously beating my tiny body. October 16, dawn, a crisp Friday in autumn with the sun yellow in the sky. The coolness of fall revived my overheated body as I dressed for my second appointment with my OBGYN. I was 13 weeks pregnant, and the vomiting and lack of appetite had reduced me to a sorry 95 pounds. You are not well. You are dehydrated, Dr. M exclaimed as soon as he laid eyes on me. He peered at my yellow sunken eyes, worried about my round-the-clock condition of HG. I described to him how odors and real pictures of food and food and smells and everything made me wretch. Everyone says I look good, which makes it seem as if I'm making up stories. I sounded pathetic, but it was the truth and my voice cracked. They keep telling me pregnancy is a normal condition, not a sickness. I whimpered and sniffled. I had worn a lilac dress with an ampere cut sewn by my seamstress in Trinidad. The fabric was a soft rayon chiffon with box pleats that fell gracefully to my ankles. The high-waisted dress provided enough room for my slowly expanding tummy. And we have a picture there. So that's the dress. That's my youngest sister. And I pretty much look like that. Maybe my hair was a little longer. That picture was taken in Trinidad. But uh, with part of that dress, uh, I was able to use it as a maternity dress. And I have since given away the dress to Value Village, and I have since tried to retrieve it from Value Village, but without success. If you are like the women in my country, the kind doctor consoled me. Many throw up, and they are very sick in pregnancy. Another balm to my soul. I had resented the barbs of a few caustic observers who cited in loud tones so I could hear that they were not sick when they were pregnant. I had bitten my tongue. The comparison was mean, but I was too polite to dish back sarcasm, and I was too sick to be able to. You need home care. Dr. Im's tone was urgent, and he picked up the phone to arrange for a nurse to come to our address. He explained the reason for his call to the person who answered and was placed on hold. Suddenly, the call was disconnected. He redialed, outlining the immediacy of the situation. One more time, the call was dropped, perhaps in an attempt to transfer it. I felt valued by his empathy and determination to get a nurse to attend to me at home. A third time, this wonderful doctor dialed a number, but I never knew if he got a hold of the department. For that moment, I slumped forward on his desk. Chapter 10 is entitled, In Heaven's Meadow. And I start all of my uh, chapters with a verse. And this one is Psalm 91, 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Simultaneous with my memory of slumping on the doctor's desk is one where I am walking uphill on soft green grass. The place is bright as if the sun is out, full, and it is daytime. On my right, a huge person strides, and I walk in his shadow. The shadow encompasses me in a circle, similar to the way the midday sun casts a shadow around a person, as opposed to the evening when shadows are long. I feel as if I know him. I know where I am. I am in heaven, in the shadow of the Almighty, spoken of 
in Psalm 91. I do not see him, but I know he is there. It's as if knowledge enters my mind at the particular time I need to know something. We do not speak, but we seem to know each other's thoughts. Our communication is a wordless language. Through this transfer of thoughts, similar to when I operate in the gift of the word of knowledge on earth. As it says in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, uh, that's from the Bible for those of you who probably may not be familiar with it. I know his and he knows mine. We walk unhurriedly. There is no haste and no strain of climbing uphill. It is as effortless as walking on level ground. There is no path, yet we walk in the same direction, purposeful of where we are going in the wide open grassy space. The green is a shade I have never seen before and as such it is indescribable. The words do not exist in my vocabulary. The hue has more yellow than I've seen on earth. I walk at my usual pace, taking small steps, and he keeps up with me. One would expect that a person as large as he would have a big stride, but though he is much bigger than I am, and he towers at my side, our paces never fall out of sync, nor does it appear that he is slowed down. We are in a large meadow, and the expanse before me is vast. Far ahead of us are trees, vibrant, healthy green trees, but not as dark as the deep forest green we have on earth. The colors of heaven do not exist on earth, and hence I cannot assign them a name. The colors are brighter and happier and rapturous to my eyes. Above us, it's cloudless, clear, it reminds me of a tropical day in the Caribbean, except there is no heat to drain my energy. There is no wind either. The temperature is ideal. Everything in this unimaginable, indescribable place is perfect. The person walking with me leads me to the top of the hill and I sit down in his shadow. A most incredible sense of peace permeates the heavenosphere as I call the atmosphere of heaven. My words cannot do justice as they fall short of what heaven is. Parts of speech fail to deliver the emotions of being in heaven because heaven is an experiential concept rather than a theoretical one. A picture might convey details, but I have no pictures as they are embedded in my mind. Peace fills me and pulsates through my being, settling in every hidden part of my bones and nerves and fibers. The entire meadow is laden with peace. Such astounding peace can only be felt, not described. Where I am, there is no sense of time. Time as we know it on earth is linear and irreversible, not in heaven. There is no dimension to time. All is still. I inhale deeply. I am contented and satisfied in ways I could have never imagined. I have no pain. I have no worries. I do not remember any sorrow. There are no hint of things negative. Down the hill, the meadow tapers out the flat land. And in the middle of it, there is a tree with a thick trunk that goes high up. There are no branches or leaves coming out from the trunk, except at the very top. It's like an umbrella, straight across, leafy and green. If you think of a letter T, you would have a visual of what that tree looks like. I've seen trees in pictures of the African savanna. And under the tree are children. And the children are playing. And they are moving in a counterclockwise direction. They're moving this way. 
There's about a dozen or so children. And there are three teenagers with them, and it's all described in the book here. My focus is on a little girl in a green dress. I sh her back is towards me, and I see the back of her head. She has dark hair. To her right side is a little boy who's blonde, and he's wearing a white shirt and khaki pants. And to the left of the child in green is a little girl in pink. And next to her is a tall teenager wearing a white top and a long blue skirt. All the children have socks and shoes and short sleeved things as if it is summertime they're dressed for. And on the other side, there's a little girl in buttery yellow. It's like a babysitting scene. And it is all very, very, very calm. And the thought comes to me that um, heaven is as peaceful as it is. Because peace as we know it on earth is a noun. But peace as we know it in heaven is a person. The Bible gives him a name in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Prince of Peace. And that's why peace on heaven is so different from any peace we would experience on earth. The sight is precious, that's the children. And I let out a sigh of contentment. It is beautiful and perfect. No one shouts. There is no noise, only quiet. No one pushes or is impatient. Unlike the typical scenes at playgrounds on earth, the children are in sync with each other. Suddenly, the little girl in the green dress tumbles and falls. Her hand is still held by the blonde boy and the girl in pink on either side of her. Everyone pauses and the circle stops. And the teenager joins the hand of the little girl she was holding with the other person. And the teenager walks around to the little girl in green who has fallen. And in the tenderest of manner, just picks her up and reestablishes her in the game. And the game continues, going counterclockwise under the tree. I keep drawing in deep breath and exhaling them with sighs of satisfaction, as if I can't get enough of this peaceful stillness, this beauty, these colors, the children. I, who had been alone, imprisoned in a sick bed with unquenchable thirst, find my release in the tranquility and calm. Here I am with children and Almighty God in this perfect, flawless meadow, relaxed, my body at rest, unfettered, with no cares, no pain, only goodness and perfection and health. Hi, come in and have a chair. This was all I desire. This is where I belong. This is what I had believed in, and this is where I wanted to be. Up to now, there had been no verbal communication in the meadow, no human voice. But without warning, I become aware that I am talking. I don't want to go back, I protest aloud. I want to stay here. I am being pulled away. By this unbelievable peacefulness, my 95-pound body ache for and finally found is mine. And no one is going to take it away. I don't want to go back, I beg again, but it is too late. You must come back. The voice is soft, but carries a finality I cannot argue with. The words hold complete authority. I have no choice. Faster than any speed I could imagine, I find myself receding from heaven, suck back to somewhere. Someone is at my side, but not as close as when we walk in the meadow. The way back looks like a dark road, spiraling as in a drawing, wide as at the heaven top, and fading to nothingness at the end, like a whirlwind, like a tornado. I feel as if I am flying backwards, my face towards heaven, my feet pointing in the direction I am traveling to. I am in a horizontal position, whizzing through the air at the speed that I cannot measure, but which feels like the twinkling of an eye 
as described in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Still mumbling that I wanted to stay, I opened my eyes to see Dr. Imms and Thomas' face hovering over mine. I was lying on a narrow examination bed, which one of them had asked me to come back. I remember asking Thomas about it, but I didn't pay attention to it because it was just so way out there. I thought at first I had fainted. I didn't have a name, didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the maturity to process what had happened to me. And Thomas told me that Dr. M, when I collapsed, Dr. M directed him to take me into the examination room. And my head was lowered and my feet were raised and the doctor gave me something to drink. And the doctor kept saying, we are losing her, we are losing her, we can't find her heartbeat, we can't find her pulse beat. And Thomas was praying. And I know that I came back because of the prayer of a praying husband, because God hears and answers prayer. And God heard his prayer and God brought me back. Now, I had not been pronounced clinically dead. The doctor had been attending to me, he could not find heartbeat, he could not find pulse. In those times, I was in heaven, just three minutes or so, experiencing the things I just described to you. What happened to me was what I would learn 19 years later is a term called near-death experience with the acronym NDE, a visit to the afterlife. I never get wary thinking about it, nor of speaking about it. After my third NDE on June 24th, 2017, uh, following dental surgery and level 10 pain, I was consumed afresh with the details of my first visit to heaven. So I phoned Thomas because I wanted to know if it was him or the doctor. I had always thought it was him because as a husband, he's more vested in me. Which one of you said you must come back? Was it you or the doctor, I asked. I can't remember all the details, he said. Whereas 19 years had elapsed and his memory had faded, mine had not. I remember everything so vividly to write it, and that's why I am choosing to speak some of it to you because it is just etched in my memory here, and nobody can take that away. But it was necessary for writing this chapter. Was it you I prodded? I really can't remember all the details he repeated. Thomas, I beg, try to remember. You must remember. I have to know who spoke so I can put it in the book. The line was silent before he replied. I was praying and the doctor was doing the medical procedures. I don't think we talked to you because you were out. We talked to each other but not to you. Then he added, suddenly sounding sure, we did not talk to you, who then had spoken to me. The hairs on my body rise as if doing a sporting wave as I wrote a sentence, and as I'm reading it to you right now. And after 19 years, I, I cannot speak or write without becoming emotional, because I know who spoke. And if he told me to come back, it means he was present where I was coming back to. Could that be the reason I have had so many supernatural experiences since the angel? Did God plan to partner with me and show me things for a greater cause? I thank Thomas for the confirmation and let my body sag on the seat. Until that day, I had lived in a state of relative oblivion to the implications of being in heaven and hearing God speak to me directly in eternity. Hearing him there is different than hearing him speak through the Holy Spirit on earth. I had heard the voice that said, let there be. And the stars fixed themselves in the galaxy. Waters flooded the ocean. Trees and animals appeared. Though the tone of the injunction given to me was low, I had the impression it echoed throughout eternity. I have brought here my childbirth diary, and I have marked it for with reference. 
this here shows that on October 16, 1998, I weighed 95 pounds and I was 13 weeks pregnant. And I wrote in the advice treatment column that I was sent to the hospital because of a fainting spell and I was given IV. I have here that they predicted on January 20th, 1999, they predicted that I was having a boy. So I took this out after 19 years of never watching it because after the baby was born, I just uh, put that away and at last we knew we were having a son. I was determined that the stereotypical colors of blue or pink would not be perpetuated at our house. So the crib bedding was the unisex color of green. The day came in April when I went to the hospital to have my son, whose name was not yet decided. 22 hours later, after labor set in, the OBGYN, it wasn't Dr. M, it was another one, held up the baby. I stared in wonder. I had never seen a newborn and the back view of a head full of hair didn't tell me much. I knew we were having a boy, but I had to ask all the same. Is it a boy or a girl? It's a girl. He smiled and the staff cheered. I froze. A girl, not a boy. I just showed you in my childbirth diary that I was having this boy. If Thomas was surprised, I couldn't tell, but I knew he was happy that the baby was here. My mind was a whirl. No wonder we could not agree on a boy's name because we did not need a boy's name. The doctor placed my little daughter on my chest. A nurse murmured, she's going to be a looker, all right. Do you have a name? Someone in the room wanted to know. We had never discussed girls' names. So no, I didn't have a name. Didn't even have a doll or a dress. I was glad I couldn't see the buzzing in my brain. My mind was not on the looks or the nurse's predictions. A memory popped up and I time traveled back to the day in August, nine months earlier, when the yellow ray appeared on the wall of my bedroom with the words radiance dancing on it in uppercase letters. Do you all remember when I read that? A proclamation from eternity of the name she should be called. Radiance, I whispered. Her name is Radiance. In unison, the team exclaimed the comments we would hear from others whenever they heard it. What a beautiful name, what an unusual name. Someone said her APGA score is a perfect 10. And I made a mental note to check out the APGA score. This is so huge. The revelation of our daughter's name was not the only epiphany I had. Now listen to this carefully. Years later, another one would give me pause. When she was born, Radiance was showered with countless gifts from friends and family, including a little green dress with short puff sleeves and a white collar embroidered with green. As I related earlier, on October 16th, 1998, I had fled Earth, I was in the shadow of the Almighty and I had been healed because I never ever threw up a day after I came back from heaven, ladies and gentlemen. That day in heaven, I was completely and perfectly healed on the spot of hyperemesis gravidera. And my ne next entry, I was at 15 weeks, 98 pounds, on November 4th, 1998. And Dr. Im said that I was okay and the heartbeat was heard. And of course, there's a corresponding page for each of these uh, entries that I've listed here that has more details. And those details are written in the book. But I wanted to tell you that that was a miraculous healing. 
That was my second miraculous healing. The first one had occurred in Trinidad uh, while watching a film, which is why I am always happy to have my testimony filmed because I sat in a coal convention hall, very much in pain, and through the medium of film, I got healed. That story is not for here, this library reading, but it's contained in this book in chapter eight. Even now I can look at the sky, we're back to radiance, and I'm remembering my time in heaven. And this is years after, probably this would have been in the early 2000s. Even now I can look at the sky and really live my time in heaven. The dozen little ones playing under the tree and moving in a circle in a counter clockwise direction. A little girl in the green dress had stumbled and fallen and was picked up and reestablished in the game. I was fascinated by her, more acutely interested in her than the rest. I felt as if I had known this child, that we had a connection. I had been framing photos when suddenly a holy awe ran up my body and chills swept over me. It was as if someone had brushed cobwebs from my face. I knew who the child was. The little girl was my child, the one I carried in my womb when I collapsed in the OBGYN's office. The dress the little girl in heaven had been wearing is the same design and color of the gift Radiance received and was wearing in the photo I was framing. But this is the photo here. Again, if I had known the significance of these things, I would have kept the dress. We gave it away to, who knows? She was two years old in Brazil. So I saw her at the back when I was sitting in Heaven's Meadow and watching. Now, you have to keep in mind that we were told we were having a boy. It's recorded in those books there. We had nothing about a girl. But I had been drawn to this little girl. I could see the back of her he head. So if you imagine her turned around and you're watching her back, but her, uh, her arms weren't up. Her, arms were, she, her hands were holding two other children, a little girl in pink to her left and a little blonde boy in um, a white shirt and khaki pants. And I wish I had kept the little dress and not given it away. But you don't know these things. Now, I told you I came back healed completely from heaven. And I told you that a little girl had stumbled and fallen, and she was picked up and reestablished in the game. It was only last week it occurred to me that the moment that the little girl was picked up was the moment I was healed. That was the moment. These downloads, ladies and gentlemen, these revelations, these insights, they don't come all on one day. It's watered, you know, the scripture talk about Mary pondered in her heart when she was having Jesus. Things are there, we ponder in our heart and we don't know how to make sense of it. Okay. It's only when people started talking about experiences in heaven, and I watch movies and a couple books, and no. that's when I realize, okay, what happened to me is something bigger and more significant. And when it happened three times, as an author, uh, I've written 14 books, 10 of my own and four are co-written. All of those were propelling me to write this one. All my education and experience and training in the word, I've, I'm trained in biblical theology. I was the valedictorian of my class when we graduated in Trinidad. Postgraduate education in the secular. I, I can defend what has happened to me. And I believe it was being groomed from small through all of this for the moment where I would say to men and women, 
that there is an eternity to gain, and it's only through Jesus Christ. So we're here with Radiance. God had allowed me to see her as he saw her. Her falling down was symbolic of the precarious position she was in, given my condition. But she did not remain fallen. Her being picked up was symbolic of restoration and healing. Father God took me home and showed me how this infant child whose life depended on mine would make it. I would become well and she would live. I don't know if you remember that the doctor was arranging for home care for me when I collapsed. I was taken home and I got my care and I came back healed. I want to talk a little bit about the children that part isn't in the book. There's, it's a whole theological debate about us being formed before the foundation of the earth. The scripture says God knew us before we were in our mother's womb. I was allowed to see that in heaven. I saw the child, not even knowing that I would have a girl child, but I was interested in this child. I, had all the details and there she was given this dress by someone I didn't buy this dress for her and that's got me thinking about children who are aborted children who are miscarried children who die for whatever reason they're so tenderly and gently taken care of because my child could have been uh, miscarried or died, or given the condition I was in. She would have been in heaven there with God. And I saw her in the future. I didn't have to, ch I was only 13 weeks pregnant when I saw this child who was either two years old or four years old. In this picture, she's two. I don't have a picture of her being four, but that dress fitted her for a number of years, as you know. Children's clothes can stretch for a number of years. And I don't know if you're a parent who have lost a child, a, a father, fathers grieve as much as mothers. But I just wanted to tell you how perfectly loved your child is in heaven. And that's why the movie Unplanned, it unhinged me, or I sat in and I wept after almost everyone had left the theater because I know all of those babies and the blue barrels. They're tenderly cared for. But I know also the mental anguish that mothers go through because a lot of them tell me and they say it's, they make a decision, but then years later it haunts them. And as they get older, it becomes worse. The memories become worse as they realize, you know, the enormity of what had happened. And I want to say to you, if you are in that situation, that God is a God who forgives. The only sin that God says is not forgivable is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit but God forgives abortion. Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. So what I say to someone who has had an abortion, I walk through many people, many women. I counsel them and I encourage them and then I carry them through until I feel that emotionally they can just walk on their own again. And I just say, the scripture say, Jesus said, go and abort no more. There's always a way that someone else can help. Don't ever get scared to that point where you feel the embarrassment or the shame. Don't ever feel that that uh, is insurmountable because it's not. And so this was an extra thing that I've tacked on to after seeing my own child in heaven who was unborn on earth and just seeing how those teenagers take the children out and a perfect babysitting scene and every child is so loved and so cared for. They have, they have um, 
miss the abuses and the violence of this evil world. They don't have to get all of the sicknesses and be bullied at school. You know, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful, incomparable life. And those children are so happy. And I hope that if your heart is grieving today, that you would find some comfort through my visit to heaven. And perhaps that's maybe why the Lord has allowed me to do it. I have had three near-death experiences. They're all listed in this book. It all comes with a price, a crippling price of pain and sickness. And for the first time in 2019, the winter, from a long, long time, I was able to say, I can go through this winter. I don't want to go back to Trinidad. I don't need the warmth of Trinidad because I have been made well, and I have been made whole. And part of that came with the obedience and writing, because I had found my purpose in telling and giving up my privacy. It's not easy to give up your privacy and talk about what has happened. But anyway, that is what I wanted to share with you in this reading. And it's now time for questions you may have. If I yes, Pastor Steve. I was in my 30s. I was. Well, for what, some reasons, um, like I remember telling my sisters about what had happened. And they did, they kind of, maybe they didn't know what to say. But they changed the conversation because this sounds really spooky. If someone was telling me about it, I might have thought, what's going on here? What had happened to me? And then I would constantly think about it. I only spoke about it once in Regina at an Aglo meeting. I talked about it, but I didn't have medical records then. So when I was writing the book, I sent for my medical records and um, different places, and I saw that I was actually healed of a second condition that same day in heaven. I came back healed of two conditions. So that's three miraculous healings, and uh, it's, it's recorded in the book what the other condition is. It's actually in chapters 8, 10, and 23, uh, those ones. Did you ever talk to your doctor later? What did he say about it? Was he a Christian or not? Or did he, did he, did it was a miracle? Or uh, uh, my doctor was a Christian, actually. Uh, we didn't. I told them that I was in heaven when I came back. Uh, and they sent me to St. Michael's Hospital to get the IV and that kind of thing. I phoned the doctor when I was writing the book. I left two messages, but I didn't hear back from them. I Facebook messaged the nurse, because I have everybody's name in there who attended to me. So I found one of them on Facebook, and I wrote her a note. And she replied after, or she read it, because you can get a little acknowledgment. She read it after the book was printed. So, but no, it's only when Heaven is for Real came out in 2013, uh, someone at church was talking about this book. I decided to read it. And then the, in 2015, I was hospitalized at Melville Hospital, and I had my second near-death experience there, which is also listed in the book. And then on... I thought, okay, I have two experiences. I'm going to write. And I had a lot of notes. I got all my notes from the Melville Hospital and all the specialists who attended to me. And then I extracted my first tooth in 2017. And uh, uh, the pain after sent me unconscious. Now, that one was very interesting. And that's actually what this book starts off with. The chapter is called Come Home because I text my husband to come home. And he was there, he was on the phone with Healthline, because we both had work in healthcare. And we know that, you know, don't come and fill up the emergency room, try and do some self-care first. So we called the Healthline for me, because I didn't know 
you extract a tooth, and this was so serious. So anyway, he was there. Then we started to see the changes in me that was happening. And I think that was one of the things that really, really made me say, I have to read this book. Because I was seeing the spiritual part. So for example, I, I saw myself in a fetal position, and water was gushing out of my stomach. And the scripture verse that came was, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So now I have looked at that scripture in a different way. And this is how the life comes out. And there was this bright light approaching me. And John 8, 12 comes to mind. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will no longer have to walk in darkness. I knew that Jesus, the light of the world, was coming to usher me personally. This light was so bright at its core. And that's the light we try to capture on the book here. So we knew then, because my husband he said, oh, no, you weren't in fetal style. You were lying on your back. And that's when we realized he had seen the physical change in me. And I had seen how the spirit transits the body. It's like a penny, any coin. One side has the queen's head, and the other side has the beaver. Um, the two sides of the same thing. And we knew we had an, something that for us is indisputable, something that I was willing to sacrifice all of my privacy and say, I don't care who knew I was in the hospital, because if you read the book, you will see how I even turned away the clergy when they came to visit me, because sickness was private for me. I wanted nobody. My pastor never knew I was in the hospital. And so the Lord was just changing me as well. So I want to officially end it off with a reading. I officially invited Jesus into my heart at age 13 during a week of Kids' Crusade at church. I say officially because I had repeated the prayer for salvation each time it was led. And with my own daily prayer that Jesus remains in my heart, this had amounted to thousands of times. The prayer went something like this. Dear Jesus, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and for giving me eternal life. Amen. And if you would pray that prayer, you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you too will live with God in eternity one day. Do you have other questions, Pastor Steve? Well, I guess for, for me, I, uh, I think I shared with you the other, the other Monday night that uh, being a pastor, I've, I've experienced people that have had near-death experiences already and had them share with me. Some of them didn't want to share it publicly to begin with because they thought people would think they're crazy. But uh, as they've had the opportunity to share, that, uh, you know, that, uh, it, it's, uh, it's always encouraged me. And I guess as a pastor, uh, as a Christian, God can do anything. And that's, I guess, the key. That he worked in your life how he did. And, and if anybody else here is a Christian, you may have had other miraculous things happen mm -hmm. to you. And uh, you don't have to be ashamed of them. Mm -hmm. You may be careful where you want to share them, I guess. It depends. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, hopefully, you feel good about it and know that God can speak to us in various ways and, and encourage us and help us and he and wants to continue to, to do that whatever way he sees fit. So you know, praise the Lord. Yes. You said you broke a total of fourteen bones. Yeah. Yes. And what were the other ones about the same kind of topic? No. I've been a school teacher so my books have a lot of them have been educational. And as a Christian, the others have been inspirational. So that's what I aim for. So I had brought this one to show the reporter from the Yorkton this week that as a nonfiction writer, I was happy I was a nonfiction writer because in producing Touch by Eternity, uh, if I was 
used to creating fiction, people would find it very hard to separate fiction from nonfiction. So when the penny retired, I created this book as a memory and a keepsake for the penny. So this is the adult version, Little Copper Pennies, and Little Copper Pennies for Kids. And speaking of that, uh, we have Touched by Eternity, and the one that is in progress is Touched by Eternity for Kids. And I have Alphabet on the Farm, um, using uh, like oh. these for dugout. There was this funny thing, uh, a little girl had my book, so her mother said, do you know who this is? And she said, no. She, so the mother said, it's the lady who wrote Alphabet on the Farm, and the little girl still didn't make a connection. And the mother said, D is for dugout, and the child <laughs> nodded her head. <laughs> and um, another children's book is an alphabet of the first Christmas, a Christian alphabet book. So I didn't bring all of them because today I was focusing on Touch by Eternity and I didn't have the adult book of the Little Cup of Pennies. So I sort of just grabbed this to show that nonfiction and education and biblical inspiration is what I do. And those were leading me and training me to put forward this. So if you take my business card, you might be able to see my website, susanharris.ca, and there's a menu tab called Books, and if you click on it, you'd see the books. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming out today. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate Colon Access 7 being here. I thank Jan for uh, opening up this uh, room to us, the city of Yorkton, as a matter of fact. The room belongs to them. So the library staff hosted us, and this could not have been made possible without you coming here. So I thank you very much, and God bless.